Thank you. Everybody hear me at the back okay? Fantastic. Okay, legacy of the Hubble Space Telescope. There can be few scientific instruments that are as recognizable as the Hubble, the HST. Not HS2, HST. <laughs> Virtually every astronomer will instantly recognize it, but also a great deal of the public will also recognize this particular beast. It's been around, of course, for a large number of years. I originally wrote this talk for its 25th birthday from launch in 1990, but now, of course, it's now reached its 30th birthday. So what I'm going to do in this particular talk is cover a little bit of introduction, uh, why we need space telescopes, what are the ground-based alternatives to using a space telescope, a little bit about the history, how it came to be, how it ended up with flawed optics and how those optics uh, ultimately got fixed, and then a little bit about the legacy. What has the Hubble Space Telescope done for us? But of course, in 30 years, it's done an enormous amount. And without taking five, six, seven hours of your time to go through all of that, I'm going to try and just cherry pick one or two bits of what Hubble has done as scientific highlights. But also touch upon the other aspect of the legacy, not the scientific legacy, but the fact that the public were along for the ride, that the public consciousness has been elevated in terms of astronomy through the existence of the Hubble Space Telescope. And then I'll, at the end, have a little bit of a forward look and ask the question again, do we need more space telescopes? Are ground-based alternatives not a viable way of doing astronomy in the future? So a reminder of scale in terms of the relative sizes of various telescope mirrors that exist. Way in the top left corner, barely a dot in this picture, is the Yerkes one meet one meter diameter lens, the largest refractor that ever was used as a scientific instrument, other than the one in the, uh, the Paris Observatory, uh, sorry, the Paris Exhibition. So a one meter lens hardly gets a look in here. The space telescopes are down in the bottom left hand corner of this diagram. So we've got the, the Hubble in the bottom right of the red rectangle, next to it the James Webb, and above it two other space telescopes, Gaia and Kepler and I'll make a mention of those towards the end of the talk. But you can see that the Hubble Space Telescope mirror is absolutely tiny compared to not only telescopes that exist now. The largest telescope that exists in terms of its uh, collecting aperture is in the top middle in yellow there, the, uh, the Gran Telescopio Canarias, the 10.4 meter diameter. Diameter is, of course, approximate given that it's not actually a circle, the collecting area of the main mirror. So that's the largest telescope at the moment, but you can see that shortly we will have absolute monsters like the 40-metre diameter European Extremely Large Telescope. So these are absolutely huge compared to the relatively modest size of the 2.4 metres of the Hubble's main mirror. So we know that telescopes have come a long way in 400 years. The Yerkes on the left, the Hale telescope on the right, the 5-meter, 200-inch Hale. We know things have come a long way, and we gave up using lenses when they got to about a meter in diameter because it became impractical to make any telescopes larger than about a meter diameter using anything but mirrors rather than lenses. And I remind you that the main driving force to make telescopes larger and larger over the entire four last centuries is the fact that if you get larger mirrors, then not only can you collect more light, which means you see fainter objects, but also the resolution, the detail you can see improves as you have larger aperture uh, telescopes. And hence, you can either see smaller objects, smaller detail in a given set of objects, or you can see similar objects at a greater distance. So you get a double whammy by making telescopes ever bigger. You get the benefit of seeing fainter objects, and you get the benefit of seeing either smaller or more distant objects. So it's a double whammy. And if you look at how telescopes have evolved over the years, there's the 200-inch, uh, 5-meter telescope, one of the biggest mirrors made in the last century before we, we moved on to uh, larger segmented mirrors. So objects... Uh, like the Keck mirror or the, uh, the Grand Telescopio Canarius, 
they're made not with a single piece of glass, but by segmenting a much larger mirror into a lot of small manageable pieces. Anything more than eight meters is almost uncastable as a mirror. So smaller than eight meters can be made as a, a, a single slab of glass. Anything larger would be segmented. But if we have the prospect of huge telescopes, they're already 10 meters across. They're already much bigger than the Hubble. And there's the prospect of um, going up in scale again to 40 meter diameter telescopes before too long. In the early part of this decade, we should see very large telescopes like the 30 meter telescope and the European extremely large telescope. So why are we bothering with space telescopes? Well, the main problem is the Earth's atmosphere. If you have a given telescope of a given size, then when you're on the ground, regardless of whether you're at sea level or even on the top of the highest mountain, you will still have a fair bit of atmosphere above you. And the Earth's atmosphere is turbulent and chaotic and basically will degrade the resolution of what you see. You will still be able to collect all the light from your large mirror, but you won't get the resolution you would hope for. For instance, the resolution of the Hubble 2.4 meter diameter mirror, if you had an identical telescope sitting on a mountain top somewhere, its resolution would be at least 10 times worse simply because of the turbulent effect of the Earth's atmosphere. So 2.4 meters isn't much, but it is when you consider the fact that it's in Earth orbit and therefore it's not subject to the degrading effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Why did they decide that 2.4 meters is the size to build the Hubble? simply because it had to fit in the vehicle of the day, which was the space shuttle, and therefore the entire Hubble, all 10 tons of it, had to fit inside the cargo bay of the shuttle. And that's what dictated, ultimately, the diameter of 2.4. Astronomers would have loved to have had a bigger space telescope, but it wasn't viable, because there was no way to get it into orbit. So let's have a look at the timeline of how things started off. Hubble as a concept is perhaps older than you think. 1970, people were still walking on the moon when NASA said, how are we going to make a large space telescope? It was called at the time the LST. It hadn't yet been renamed the Hubble. So the first milestone is NASA starts thinking about how to put a large space telescope into orbit. Any idea what the second milestone is? It gets cancelled, yeah, okay. So Congress pulls the funding on it and says, great idea, guys, way too expensive, um, so we're not going to do that. Um, this then caused a reaction. Scientists started uh, lobbying their, their various senators, and there was serious letter writing. That's how important it was. People started writing letters to politicians saying, you've got to give us the funding because this is an important scientific instrument. Um, eventually, the Senate agreed to funding at a reduced level, and basically they got on board with ESA. So it's often thought that the Hubble Space Telescope is treated like a NASA telescope. Actually, it's not. It's NASA ESA, but NASA put in more of the money, so I suppose it's fair that we tend to think of it as an American uh, telescope. But strictly speaking, it's American and European. So, in uh, 1978, Congress basically uh, uh, agreed to funding because ESA were on board taking some of the financial load, and therefore the project went ahead. The spacecraft construction was tendered, and it ended up with Lockheed, and the optics went to Perkin Elmer. NASA do consider the Hubble as a spacecraft. We tend to think of it as just a telescope in space. NASA basically says it's a spacecraft, and by the way, there happens to be some optics inside it, because that's its job. So the, the, the construction was split. Lockheed, uh, aircraft manufacturer, um, were tasked with making effectively the superstructure, the power systems, the solar panels, making sure everything worked as a spacecraft. And Perkin Elmer were given the job of making the mirrors. So as of uh, 1979, uh, the construction of the mirror began. Perkin Elmer took this on, saying, ha, we are going to make the best mirror ever. So in 1979, they started figuring and polishing the mirror and testing it to make sure it was absolutely spot on. And it took them about a, a couple of years. With larger mirrors, 8 meters, 10 meters, etc., it might take a little longer. But this was, even in its day, a relatively modest size mirror size of only 2.4 meters in diameter. And therefore, it only took them a couple of years. And after two years, they declared that polishing was complete 
and the mirror was as perfect as they could make it. And Congress had already anticipated that the mirror, of course, is the most important part of the telescope. And just to be on the safe side, because we can't get away without a mirror, as well as tasking Perkin Elmer to make the mirror, they asked Kodak to make a backup completely independently, independent casting of glass, independent polishing, independent testing. And after two years, Perkin Elmer said, our mirror is absolutely fine. So basically, any further work on the backup was stopped. Kodak said, well, we've got a perfectly good mirror, but if you don't need it, fine, uh, it goes in a museum. So basically, the Kodak mirror went into a museum at that point, 1981. It was ready for launch, uh, thought about in the 70s, designed in the early 80s. It was originally planned to launch in the early 80s. So 83 was the nominal launch date that they were planning for in the late 70s and early 80s. But things started to slip. The LST at this point was renamed the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, in honor of Edwin Hubble, who had done so much work on the 100-inch Hooker Telescope, looking at the recession velocity of galaxies from their redshifts of their spectra. 1984, uh, there were a few slips, uh, mainly due to Perkin Elmer, but 1985, there were slips due to Lockheed and Perkin Elmer. So things got a little bit behind schedule, but it was it's basically ready by 1986. By that point, the budget had already hit about $1 billion. This is not including the cost of all subsequent shuttle launches for pr a predicted maintenance of the system. This is just where we are up to this point. And 1986, they were ready to go, but unfortunately 1986 was the year of the Challenger disaster. So we had uh, a shuttle that blew up on launch, and that, of course, put the shuttle program back quite a few years. And even when the shuttles were then ready for launch, there was then a backlog of satellites and other things to go up. Military had their pick of uh, first dibs in getting their satellites back up. And it wasn't until 1990 that the Hubble Space Telescope, as it was then renamed, actually got into orbit. So we perhaps tend to think of 1990 as the start of the Hubble's life. Strictly speaking, it was already 20 years old in that it was thought about in the 70s, designed in the late 70s, built in the early 80s, and by 1990 it was finally in orbit. At this point, nobody can really put their finger on it, but the estimated bill in terms of how much it cost to get to this point was something of order $2.5 billion. So quite an expensive piece of hardware that now sitting in Earth orbit. Before we say about what happened with the mirror, let's just backtrack slightly to make it clear why there were problems. The Hubble Space Telescope uses a particular design of mirrors. Perhaps you're used to the idea that if you make a primary mirror in the shape of a parabola, or a paraboloid in three dimensions, then light from infinity will focus to a point. Light hitting anywhere on the mirror will come to a point. The design of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope was a so-called Ritchie-Cration design. This doesn't use a parabola to focus a distant point of light. Parabolas uh, have a problem in that they will focus perfectly light that hits the mirror broadside, but light that comes in at an angle will not form a perfect focus. In other words, a parabola will perfectly focus a small star field, but as you go towards the corners of your field of view, as you go away from the center line, you will get distortion. It's called chromatic aberration or coma. And to get around that, it was decided that they would use uh, a rich equation design, which uses not a parabolic mirror, but a slightly different shape. It doesn't matter if you remember your conic sections, but you have circles, ellipses, parabola, and hyperbola. A parabola is a bit like an ellipse that's been opened up slightly. A hyperbola is a bit like a parabola, but again, it's been opened up slightly. And by having a primary and secondary mirror that are both hyperbolic curves or shapes, you can get rid of this so-called chromatic aberration that would plague a parabolic system. In fact, the last big telescope that used a parabola was, in fact, the 200-inch, the 5-meter Hale telescope. At the time, the Ritchie creation design was established. This was designed in the, in the 1930s or thereabouts. Uh, and Ritchie creation, the design existed. Ritchie was one of the optical technicians that were working on the uh, design of the, the Hale. But Hale himself was a little bit conservative and didn't want to 
risk going with hyperbolic mirrors, not least because it wasn't known exactly how to make them in the days before computer-controlled grinding machines. So Hale decided to go with a parabola, and that was the last big telescope that used a parabolic collecting surface for the primary mirror. Everything since then, pretty much everything, has been hyperbolic mirrors, especially the Ritchie creation design. So then we come back to what actually happened. They've launched it, it's 1990, it's now in orbit, and they point it at a star and say, let's have a look at how good it is. And what they find is, what they're expecting is what's on the left. This is just a, a symbolic indication of what they would expect. They would expect nice pinpoint stars, but what they actually saw was most of the light going to a point, but then quite a bit of light, you know, 10 or 15% of the light, seemed to exist in this sort of halo around the pinpoint stars, especially the bright ones. They thought, is it something wrong? Have we got the secondary in the wrong position? Let's try focusing. Let's make sure the whole system has cooled down and we're not trying to use it too early. But no matter how much they moved things around and checked and rechecked and double-checked, they had to admit the mirror has spherical aberration. The primary mirror has not been made to the correct specification. Let's remind ourselves what we mean by spherical aberration. Let's forget the secondary mirror. Let's just imagine that this mirror is supposed to bring all light to the same focus. Light hitting the mirror comes to a focus at a particular point. If light hits a slightly different part of the mirror, it should come to the same focus, but in spherical aberration, the further out from the center line we go, the shorter the focal length. Perhaps you can see they don't quite meet in the same place. And spherical aberration gets worse as you go further out, and if you hit the edges of the mirror, it doesn't come to anywhere near the same focus. This is called spherical aberration because this is precisely the aberration you would expect if you simply had a circular or spherical mirror producing the focusing of the light. Parabolas shouldn't suffer from this, nor should hyperbole. But the mirror in the Hubble Space Telescope suffered from this particular problem. If you put the sensing device, either the slit of the spectrometer or the camera chip, at that particular location in the middle of where all the light comes to focus, well, pretty much none of it comes to focus in the right place. You could move the chip a little further back so that most of the light comes to a correct focus, but you can see, because of light hitting the edge of the mirror, the red lines here, because that focus is in front of the chip, you end up with a defocused halo of light hitting the CCD, hitting the chip. And therefore, this is precisely what was observed. Most of the light, 80 to 90% of the light, is being focused in the right place, but 10 to 15% of it ends up as this smudged halo surrounding the star. And a reminder that that's what it's supposed to look like. We're supposed to be getting 99% of the light all concentrated into this tiny disk, effectively a point of light. Just to give it some perspective, yes, they were having trouble getting the light focused, but you could ask the question, well, what would you expect? A 2.4-meter mirror, how would you expect that to perform if this was actually sitting on a mountaintop rather than sitting in orbit? Well, yes, it would actually perform a lot worse. What we're talking about in terms of the differences here are fairly small compared to the amount of blurring you would expect if the Earth's atmosphere was having its way. But the taxpayers of uh, Europe and America have just paid $2.4 billion for a telescope that doesn't really perform much better than the same size telescope sitting on the ground, which would have been a tiny fraction of the price had it been left on the ground somewhere. So billions of dollars have been spent putting this turkey into orbit, and it doesn't even perform correctly. So that was the basic problem. How could such a monumental error actually be made? Well, part of it harks back to the fact that it is a Ritchie creation design. These are not spherical or parabolic mirrors. A parabolic mirror, all you need is a star or a very distant object, and you just check that it comes to a point focus. But a hyperbola doesn't come to a focus. You need two mirrors to make a hyperbolic mirror telescope work. And you can't make two mirrors in parallel and test them both. You have to make one and test it, and you make the other and test it. You can't have a test because you don't know where the problem is if it doesn't quite work correctly. So Perkin Elmer said, well, I don't know, because um, you know, we've, uh, we've 
check this, and the surface roughness is only about 10 nanometers or so. The difference between mountains and valleys in the surface of this 2.4 meter diameter mirror is only about 10 nanometers. And if you scale that to something more manageable, imagine that 2.4 meters was scaled up until it was the size of the Earth, then how big would the roughness be? How big would the mountains and valleys be? They would be a few centimeters or so. So if you imagine something the size of the Earth and a shape that is smooth to within a few centimeters, that gives you an idea of how precise the surface of the Hubble Space Telescope mirror was actually manufactured. Unfortunately, it was precisely the wrong shape. It was not the correct hyperbola. They had made it wrong, and it was wrong by a whopping two microns. The wavelength of light is about half a micron. So you might be used to thinking about telescopes, and uh, uh, the telescope mirrors ought to be made accurately to within a fraction of the wavelength of light. If you can get a, a mirror that's made to a quarter of the wavelength of light, or an eighth of the wavelength of light, that's fantastic. If you can get it to a tenth of the wavelength of light, even better. But this isn't even accurate to four wavelengths of light. It is absolutely way off. And so you can never expect that to focus correctly when different parts of the mirror are um, basically sending light uh, to a focus, which is moving in position, depending on where the light hits the mirror, simply because it is the wrong shaped mirror. So Perkin Elmer said it was smooth. For sure it's smooth, but it's the wrong shape. And then we come back to the problem. If you can't simply say, well, we expect it to come to a point focus with a hyperbola, how do you test that a hyperbola is doing its job? Well, one way of testing it is to trick the testing rig into thinking it's dealing with a, uh, a parabola rather than a hyperbola. In other words, you put in some little corrective optics. It's a so-called null corrector. It's part of the test rig that basically makes the test rig think it's dealing with a parabola and so is looking for all the light coming to a perfect focus. But the null corrector, which is effectively mirrors and or lenses, has to be in a particular position relative to the mirror. And they put the null corrector in the wrong place. They put one of the elements of the null corrector on the test rig into the wrong location. Different reports say exactly what happened, but the bottom line is there was a washer uh, where a washer shouldn't have been. In other words, it was off by something like a millimeter. Just to give you an idea, the focal length of the Hubble Space Telescope is about 58 meters. And this null corrector was misplaced. One of the elements of the null corrector was misplaced by perhaps a millimeter. <sighs> oh. Afterwards, when they realized the mirror has spherical aberration, they asked Perkin Elmer to go back to the test rig and they found the problem. They then realized, when they did double-checking, triple-checking, that the null corrector wasn't set up correctly. And they have reasons as to why that might be. But the bottom line is, a much simpler test, a much cheaper test, would have told them that there was a problem. But Perkin Elmer said, no need. There's no need to do a simple test, because our super-duper, fantastic, uh, high-tech test shows us that the mirror is absolutely perfect to within 10, 20 nanometers or so. And therefore, there's no need to do another test. Everything is hunky-dory. With hindsight, it's very easy to say, why didn't they do a simple test? A few thousand dollars could have been spent on a simple test to tell them, hang on, guys, something is wrong here. But it was deemed unnecessary. So now we have a faulty mirror in orbit. And we have a perfectly good backup mirror made by Kodak sitting in a museum. So there's the quandary. You've got a duff mirror in orbit, and you've got a good mirror on the ground. What do you do about it? How do you save this situation? They had a good old think about it, and basically the one thing that saved the whole program was the fact that from the outset, the Hubble Space Telescope was designed to be serviceable by the shuttle. And therefore, they had an ability to correct, in principle, the mistake. So what do you do? Do you um, send the shuttle up and recapture the Hubble and bring it back down again through the Earth's atmosphere and hope the vibration and everything else doesn't affect the, uh, the telescope? And then get it on the ground and then start again. Take the, tele uh, take the mirror out, replace it with the, uh, with the Kodak, or double check the Kodak is OK, put the Kodak one in, uh, and then uh, a few years later relaunch it back into orbit. That was seriously considered. But the one thing that actually saved them was 
a combination of ingenuity and luck, and that is the fact that they had a perfectly serviceable spare camera sitting on the ground. Having gone back to Perkin Elmer, they know what the problem was. They know the test rig was off by precisely that much. And therefore, they know that if they were supposed to make the mirror this shape, and they know the test rig was out by precisely this much, they know precisely what the error is. It's not a random error. It's not off by two microns, but we don't know exactly how. They knew precisely what the actual shape of the mirror was and why it suffered from spherical aberration. If you know precisely what the optics are, you can basically correct for them in much the same way that as long as you know to what extent your own vision is incorrect, you can wear spectacles or something to correct that vision. As long as you know what it's wrong by, you can correct for it. So they had a camera on the ground. They knew what the problem with the main mirror is. This was a non-flight version. This is quite common when you send either spacecraft up or probes out to the distant part of the solar system. It's not unusual to build a duplicate and you send one and you keep the other in the lab. If the one you've sent up into space starts to misbehave, you start interrogating the duplicate you've got on the ground to try and figure what the problem is. It's a very useful diagnostic. In this case, they had a second camera, and basically they could say, right, this second camera is designed to be interchangeable. It's designed to be effectively plug and play. Well, not quite, but within a few hours, it should be possible to take one camera out and put another camera in. And if we know what the problem is, we can send up a second camera with whatever corrective optics it takes. The light comes down, hits that mirror, and then goes into the camera. All you need to do is intercept the light somewhere between the main mirror and the camera and insert an extra corrective lens and or mirror. It's actually easier to make a small mirror than it is a small lens in this context. So all you need to do is basically figure out what corrective optics you need, build it into the second camera, and then fly the second camera up there because it was designed ultimately to have its cameras swapped anyway. So that's what saved it, the fact that serviceable missions had already been planned. What about the other instruments? That gets you a working camera, but the Hubble is not just a big camera with a telephoto lens, basically. The Hubble is, at any given time, uh, a couple of cameras and a couple of spectrometers. So what you need is some way of fixing all the other instruments that are there, not just the camera which is on the ground, which can be fixed and sent up. What about the cameras and spectrometers that are already on board that can't easily be swapped out, not on day one anyway? You build yourself a set of corrective optics. This is the actual CoStar, for reasons I'll explain later. Eventually it came back down to Earth. And it's easier to see what CoStar is if you look at this model in the museum. It's a set of mirrors on a whole load of arms such that, on command, a given arm jumps out and sends the light from the, uh, the main mirror or the secondary mirror and then directs it into whichever instrument you want, whether it be a spectrometer or a camera. But the mirrors are designed, the extra elements of CoStar, the corrective optics, these extra uh, mirrors that are put into the light path are designed to be exactly the right shape to correct for the fact that the light coming from the main mirror suffers from spherical aberration. As long as you know what the aberration is, you can correct it by putting uh, the right shape into these corrective optics. Each instrument will need a different mirror because they're all positioned in different parts, as we'll see shortly, different parts of, the, uh, of the, the back end of the Hubble. And so you just need to have a number of these things, and they're all motorized such that on command, if you want to use camera number one or camera number two or spectrometer number one or spectrometer number two, an arm will come out, and hopefully that mirror will then be in exactly the right position and will have exactly the right shape in order to correct for the optics of the, uh, the main mirror. So that was the idea. It's not simply a CCD camera, which is how you tend to think of the Hubble. If you talk about the Hubble Space Telescope, everybody thinks of the images. But it's not just cameras. It's spectrometers as well. At any given time in the last 30 years, Hubble has had two cameras and two spectrometers, at least. It's now got more than that. But at any given time, at least two cameras and at least two spectrometers. Uh, and as I mentioned a while ago, uh, one has to remind oneself about the scale of these things. The latest camera to go into the Hubble has got a chip that size, four by four centimeters. Whoops, not particularly large, 
easy to drop, apparently. Four by four centimeters, and remember its focal length is about 58 meters nominally. So you can imagine that being at the end of a telephoto lens 58 meters long. Another way to think of it is how much sky does it actually cover in terms of its field of view. Imagine taking this and having your arm 58 meters long. That gives you an idea of the patch of sky that Hubble covers. So that is the high resolution camera that's now in there. But at the back end, let's just make that a little bit bigger. Most of the instrumentation is at the back end of the Hubble. Again, you can see that it is a spacecraft, not a telescope, because the telescope optics actually only occupy a little less than half of the total uh, volume of the telescope. Uh, the main mirror is here, indicated by primary, the secondary mirror there. You can see that the, the, the front 25% of the Hubble is actually just a lens hood. There's nothing actually there. And the back, whatever, one third is all of the instrumentation, the spectrometers, etc. Uh, around the edges are various other instruments such as the, the power subsystems and the gyros which are responsible for making sure that the telescope points and stays locked on to whatever target they are trying to image. So there are a number of different instruments in there. We're not going to worry too much about all the various acronyms that are used. I'll say something about that shortly. But just a quick word about spectroscopy. Yes, we tend to think of the Hubble as being something that produces fantastic images. But if you remind yourself about spectroscopy, scientifically, that is vitally important. If we have a look at a star, it might have a particular spectrum. If you look at how much light is produced as a function of its color or wavelength, we might see something that looks a little bit like that curve there. If the star is actually exciting a whole load of atoms in the atmosphere of the star, then it might be that we get a whole load of lines uh, occurring within that spectrum, within the continuous spectrum that's in the background there of the star. And if the star is shining through something between the star and us, it might be uh, partly absorbed by the interstellar medium or something else that happens to be on a line of sight between the star and us. And then we find that some colors will be missing. In other words, there'll be lines, but there'll be dips. There'll be absorption lines in the spectrum. And those uh, either emission lines or absorption lines, those characteristic lines uh, on top of the background blur of the whole spectrum from the star, those are characteristic of particular atoms or possibly molecules that exist either in the atmosphere of the star or in interstellar space. So by looking at where they occur, we don't just look at their color, we measure very accurately what the wavelengths are, then we can identify that particular line is coming from oxygen, that particular line is coming from hydrogen, that one is coming from sodium, that one is coming from iron, etc. Not only does that give us chemical information about what it is we're looking at, but also we can look at where those are, and if they don't occur at the same wavelength as the equivalent elements in the laboratory, we can do the same thing. We can heat up various gases or solids and see what particular emission lines they have, what particular wavelengths those elements emit at. If we see them shifted in the object we're looking at, the star or the galaxy, then we can determine how fast that object is moving towards us or away from us because the Doppler shift will move those things by a given amount for a given either recession velocity or approach velocity. So images are great. They show us what something looks like. But if we can take the spectra of that object, then we can tell what it's made of and we can tell what it's doing, which scientifically is far more important than simply seeing what it looks like. Ultimately, of course, it's the combination of the two. What's actually going on in terms of what does it look like and what is it made of and what is it doing? Only when we have cameras in complement with spectrometers do we get the full picture of what's actually going on. As far as the public is concerned, they see the pictures. Showing a spectrum to the public doesn't get you very far. You have to have nice pictures to get the public along for the ride. I don't want to spend too much on this, but this gives you an idea of the complexity that the astronauts had to deal with in terms of a few years' worth of service missions to get things right. Remember, the first thing they had to do was fix the optics such that they had a working camera and ideally got all the other instruments to work. So the instruments are indicated by these horizontal lines. It doesn't matter too much about what these all mean. I'm not going to go through all the acronyms. But just as a rough rule of thumb, if an acronym ends with a C, it's probably a camera. And if it ends with an S, it's probably a spectrometer. That's pretty much all you need to know. 
Also here on uh, lines three and four, I've got gyros, because they need maintenance as well, and the electrical subsystems, the power systems, etc., also needs a tweak every once in a while. So what happened was, um, after the problem was diagnosed in 1990, they started working on CoStar. As far as I know, they didn't give the job of building CoStar to Perkin Elmer. <laughs> They didn't trust them anymore, uh, but Perkin Elmer were honest enough to say, this is what we did wrong, and knowing that, it was then possible to build uh, the optics corrections. So a few years after 1990, service uh, mission one went up and replaced camera one with camera two. Camera two has got the correction built into it. It's part of the camera, and so that camera should now work. CoStar, the Swiss Army knife of all those levers and mirrors that are going to make sure all the other instruments now work, that was never anticipated in the original design. So one of the instruments would have to be sacrificed to make enough space to put CoStar in. And they decided that this guy, HSP, it happens to be a photometer, which is designed to look at the intensity, how bright particular stars are. That had to be sacrificed. They wanted to keep the cameras, keep the spectrographs, Let's ditch the photometer. So the photometer was replaced with CoStar, which then hopefully got all the other instruments working as well. The asterisk simply means whilst they were there, the astronauts did a little bit of a tune-up, a little bit of a tweak to make sure the gyros are working correctly and the electronics are working correctly. The astronauts were told, please plug this camera in, plug CoStar in the right way up, and then let the scientists take a few images, and then we'll find if it works or not. By the way, it's got to work. Uh, NASA has just spent two and a half billion dollars putting a turkey into orbit. If this doesn't fix the problem, then it's not just a question of this being the end of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is probably the end of NASA. There is no way NASA could go back to Congress and ask for a few billion dollars more to do something else. If they've asked for two and a half billion dollars and built a turkey and they proved that they can't even get that right, then basically it is likely that Congress would simply call it a day and NASA would fold. No pressure on the astronauts whatsoever to make sure it all worked correctly. But as I'm sure you know, everything did work okay. When they tested the cameras, the cameras worked according to the original specification. In other words, all indications of the spherical aberration were correctly dealt with by the correction optics, and NASA breathed a corporate sigh of relief because they were saved in that respect. A few years on, another service mission um, one spectrometer is swapped with another, and one spectrometer is swapped with another. It doesn't matter what the acronyms actually mean. Why bother swapping spectrometers? Well, remember, planned in the 70s, built in the late 70s, ready to fly in the early 80s, it's already old. By the late 1990s, the Hubble Space Telescope is already not state-of-the-art as far as instrumentation is concerned. The mirror's as good as you can get, but basically technology moves on. So they replaced the spectrometers because they were able to. It was possible to put up, in principle, higher resolution, better spectrometers, simply because technology has marched on in the last decade or two. With uh, Service Mission 3, they basically needed a tweak to the gyros to make sure the gyros worked correctly. They had some problems with the gyros in the previous few months. And everything was looking good, except one of the spectrometers failed. The gray means they are having problems with that particular instrument. So one spectrometer is giving them problems. So the second half of Service Mission 3, a little bit later, um, fixed the problem with that spectrometer and made a final switch of instrumentation. Rather cunningly, they've replaced the camera with another camera, but it is a camera, even though it looks like a spectrometer because there's an S on the end. No, that's the advanced camera for surveys. Quite why they decided to change their acronyms, I don't know. But they've basically replaced one camera with another. Now, all the instruments have been swapped out. They originally swapped out the camera, and now they've swapped out one spectrometer with another, one spectrometer with another, one camera with another. All the instruments have now been swapped out, so CoStar is no longer necessary. It doesn't have a job to do anymore. Whilst they were there, they tweaked the electronics and uh, tweaked, uh, made sure that one was working. And 
a little while later, you see a few years later, they started having problems. Again, the gray indicates some instruments started to have problems. Also, they had problems with some of the electrical subsystems as well. But they had a problem with this spectrometer and that camera. So it was decided, yes, OK, um, we need to have a fourth service mission. Originally, uh, Congress were going to say, no, you don't really need a fourth service mission. NASA insisted we've got to get everything working 100%. Yes. The, the shuttle fleet will be decommissioned, and there will come a time when we can't have any more service missions. But whilst the shuttles are still flying, please give us one final service mission. And that's what they did in 2009. They made a final change of cameras. Again, technology moves on. The cameras have got higher pixel densities, etc. So more pixels in this final camera three. That's the one that I showed you, the four by four centimeter chip. So now we've got the final uh, camera three, a tweak on the gyros, a tweak on the electronics. Let's make sure this spectrometer, that spectrometer, and that camera are all working. And as I say, we don't need CoStar anymore. So CoStar can be unplugged and brought back to Earth and put in a museum, which is the picture I showed earlier. And now we have a spare slot, so we can reinstate one of the instruments that had to be sacrificed when CoStar went in. And they decided another spectrometer. That again shows you the importance of spectroscopy. Two cameras, three spectrometers, reminds you that scientifically spectrometers or spectroscopes are more important than cameras. So by 2009, that's the situation they were in. As far as I know, nothing has catastrophically failed since then. So we've had an amazingly blank decade since that last service mission up to where we are now in 2020. And fingers crossed, if nothing fails, that will continue service for a while yet. It's solar powered. There's no fuel to run out as such. And as long as the gyros keep pointing the instruments where the telescope needs to be pointed, if individual spectrometers and cameras fail, there's five functional systems. As long as one of them keeps working, the Hubble will continue to produce useful scientific data. So let us hope that this picture shouldn't end at 2020, but continues for another five or maybe even 10 years beyond the right-hand side of that diagram. But it's a reminder of what a checkered history it has. You think of the Hubble telescope as being an object. Strictly speaking, it's lots of interchangeable objects. It's almost like Trigger's broom. They've swapped the cameras, they've swapped the spectroscopes, and they've corrected the optics. So it's not really the same telescope they launched in 1990, though we tend to think of it as simply an entity. So there we are in terms of how we got to be where we are now in 2020 with a fantastic telescope, which is doing a fantastic job. So what about the legacy? It would be nice to be able to cover and do full justice to everything that it's done in the last 30 years, but clearly haven't got time. So I'm just going to pick out one or two things, probably not even this list, Cepheids, exoplanets, um, something about galaxies, and supernova, just to give you a taste of some of the highlights of what Hubble has done for us. One of the first things it did was look at the Andromeda galaxy. This might look like the Milky Way, but this is just part of the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, the core is over there on the left, the nucleus. And a lot of these stars are in the Andromeda galaxy. Some of the brighter ones might be in the Milky Way that we're looking past. But a lot of the fainter ones will be in the Andromeda galaxy. And what it did was identify Cepheid variables. These are stars whose luminosity changes and the period over which they change, the time period over which the luminosity changes, tells you how luminous the star is. And if you know how luminous the star is, in other words, if you watch them and just see what the time variation looks like and measure that time period, if you then use that to give you the luminosity, if you know the luminosity and you know how faint it looks rather than how bright it actually is, you get a distance. And hence, it was possible for the Hubble to actually determine the distance to the Andromeda galaxy more accurately than any other previous uh, measurement. So I think prior to the Hubble, they thought that the Andromeda galaxy was about 2.2 million light years away. Once Hubble had done its work and determined that distance from the Cepheid variables, it found that it wasn't 2.2, it was about 2.5. 2.5. In other words, the universe suddenly got 10% bigger overnight, as it were. And if our distance to Andromeda is wrong, then our distance to more remote galaxies is wrong as well. So it's part of the distance ladder that tells us how big the universe is. 
So one of Hubble's first jobs was to tell us how big the universe is, and that it did by looking at Cepheids. It also did some pioneering work on exoplanets. Perhaps we're used to now the idea of Kepler discovering a planet every other day or something. Now there's thousands of exoplanets that are known. But in the early days, here we're looking in the early noughties, so the Hubble had been up for a, a decade or more, Hubble was able to actually image directly exoplanets. Kepler and other systems determine the existence of exoplanets, infer the existence of exoplanets, either by looking to see stars wobbling, and hence you determine that there must be planets going around making the stars wobble as they move around their centre of gravity, or you look for stars that dip in their magnitude, in their brightness, because a planet moves in front of the star. So you determine it either by the transit method, looking for dips in intensity, or by the wobble method, looking for variations in the star's position as the massive planets move around the star. But the Hubble was actually able to image a star uh, and its planets directly. It looks very odd because there's a huge amount of light scattered from the star, which is much, 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 much brighter than the planets. So the star has been sort of digitally removed. The dot just tells you where the star was originally. We're left with all of this scattered light. But if we look in the box indicated here, we find that when it Hubble imaged this region, it found a little blob of something or other, and a couple of years later, that blob had moved, and you can infer that this, this is actually moving in a very large orbit around the star uh, um, Formalote in uh, Pisces Astranis. So Hubble was able to image exoplanets long before they became popular enough to um, invent, uh, sorry, discover one every day or so. Not only could it actually directly image, it can do what many telescopes can't do, and that is it can take a spectrum of exoplanets. If a planet moves in front of a star, the spectrum of the star changes ever so slightly, and if you look at what peaks go up or down in the spectrum, you can infer the existence of certain molecules within the atmosphere of the exoplanet. And Hubble was able to measure the water abundance of various exoplanets, uh, I think this is a similar vintage to the previous picture. I think perhaps a little bit later than the previous image it took of, uh, of the exoplanets. So through spectroscopy, Hubble was able to determine uh, a crude estimate of atmospheric content of exoplanets, which even today is very difficult. Of course, Hubble has looked at I don't know how many thousands of galaxies, trying to determine what galaxy structures exist and hence get an idea of galaxy evolution, whether it be conventional spiral galaxies or very odd structures like this, which can't quite decide whether it wants to have spiral arms or not because they don't appear to be connected to the central core region. It appears to be a, a sort of continuous arm that just goes round in a circle rather than a Catherine wheel type arm that comes off the core and disappears uh, into infinity. But one of the most amazing images, I think, of, of, of galaxies that Hubble has taken is this one. It was looking at galaxy clusters. These are interesting because uh, light bends as it passes through these galaxy clusters. There's a large amount of mass in a galaxy cluster, as well as a, a very large amount of dark matter, it is assumed. Then we can determine that light travels not in straight lines, but gets curved by its passage through a galaxy cluster. And what can happen is more distant objects can be imaged through this process. In other words, we might have a very distant galaxy. Let's imagine we've got a little blue galaxy there. And on the way to the Hubble Space Telescope, the light passes through this galaxy cluster, which is mainly uh, these orangey type um, objects, the fuzzy objects we can see in the, in the middle here. And what happens is, because we have a very large mass, the light is bent by this very large mass, ordinary matter as well as dark matter, and takes different paths as it comes through. So what we're actually imaging here is a galaxy, and what's next to it is another image of the same galaxy. And what's over here in the top left is another image of the same galaxy. In other words, light has passed through this cluster and, and has been bent by different amounts and has produced multiple images of the same galaxy. Not only that, but rather amazingly, that galaxy seems to have four supernova in it. Supernova, you would expect, may be once every 100 years in a galaxy. We're certainly overdue for a supernova in the Milky Way galaxy. We haven't had a good supernova for ages. Betelgeuse is doing its best to sort of really give it a go, but so far, still no supernova. This is not fair. How can one galaxy have four go off at the same time? 
a little bit of close inspection reveals that actually there's a distant blue galaxy and right in the same line of sight there happens to be a foreground galaxy which is this orangey one. And that foreground galaxy is basically producing small deviations to the light coming from this distant galaxy and is imaging the same supernova four times. It's called an Einstein cross. And that's pretty amazing. You can verify that they are the same supernova by taking their spectra. You take a spectrum from each of them, you find not only do they look the same, they have identical spectra. So they are the same object, as far as we can tell. Not only that, but you give this to a theorist who says, well, I think the matter and the dark matter are arranged like this. They have to be arranged like that in order to explain these various distortions of the galaxy that we can see, the main image, the secondary image, the tertiary image, the other distortions in the background. You can work out where the mass has to be to produce those distortions of space. And the theorist can tell you that light from this distant galaxy takes a certain length of time to reach the Hubble, but light that takes this route, dog legs a little bit further, the speed of light is constant, so if it goes further, it takes longer. So that light is at least a few months, if not a year or two, behind the light that's come this way. It might be a billion light years away, but the light that takes a dog leg will have to travel at least another year to arrive. So depending on when you catch this one, the theorist said, Watch this galaxy over here. It's the same galaxy, but we're looking back an extra year in time because light is taken a longer route to reach us. So if these supernova has just gone off, we can predict, based on looking at how light travels through this supercluster, that if we go back and have a look at that galaxy in seven months' time, or whatever it is they predicted, if we go back in six months and have a look in seven months and eight months, we can predict that a supernova will be seen to go off because it, we know it's already happened and this is just a few months behind it. And that's what they did. They tasked the Hubble to go back to that distant galaxy and look again seven months later, and I think seven and a half months later, bam, they saw that supernova go off. One of the first times they've ever caught a supernova right at the start of its rise. Normally you wait until something is really bright and then you notice something has happened and then you start imaging it. This is why it'd be really useful if we start imaging Betelgeuse now and then if it did go supernova, we would have early indications of what's going on because most of the time we miss a supernova because we only catch it once it's really bright and visible from a great distance. So this is one amazing coincidence of alignment of galaxies that allowed theorists to predict. If you look there, you'll see a supernova go off, and that is indeed what happened. This was back in 2015, if I remember rightly. And that's the mechanics, if you like, of how the light got from that galaxy to us. Everybody, I think, knows about the Hubble deep field. It took a little bit of argument on the people who were deciding where Hubble should point. Lots of people said there's lots of interesting objects in the universe we really ought to point the Hubble at. And when somebody said, let's look at nothing in particular, he was laughed out of the room quite a few times until he eventually convinced them, no, seriously, let's look at nothing and take a 10-day exposure, 1 million seconds or thereabouts, let's expose for 10 days at nothing in particular and see what's there. And eventually they got time to do that and that became known as the Hubble Deep Field. And here... I'm not sure how many stars there are in this particular image. I can see two, three. There might be three stars in this image, and every other dot in the image is a galaxy. There are thousands upon thousands of galaxies. Just to make sure it wasn't a fluke, they took another picture in the southern hemisphere and did a similar exposure and convinced themselves, yep, that's what the universe looks like. We don't necessarily see that all the time unless we look really deep, i.e. a long exposure to pick up all of that light then we realize just how the universe is structured. And we look back many billions of years in terms of what we're seeing in deep fields such as this. So it took a little while before people convinced that this was a worthwhile thing to do. But now that we have this data, we have phenomenally useful data in terms of a deep look back time to the early stages of the universe. Just to remind you, I showed you earlier the size of the chip. 58 meter focal length. You can see the field of view is tiny. There's the field of view, uh, and the moon is there just for a comparison. You know the moon is about half a degree in angular size. So the area covered by the Hubble Space Telescope is absolutely tiny. It's been roughly calculated that 
there are plenty of telescopes on the ground that are designed to survey the entire sky. If you ask the Hubble to survey the entire sky, given that it can only take pictures of a very small field of view at any given time, if you wanted Hubble to survey the entire sky, it would take about a century or so. So it gives you an idea of why the Hubble is tasked with only looking at interesting objects, because it hasn't got time to simply scan everything and see what's out there. But the Hubble Deep Field was just one exception, or two exceptions, just to see what's going on. And the Ultra Deep Field, again, Deep Field was in the Northern Hemisphere. Ultra Deep Field was uh, added to in, in terms of trying to push as far as it can go. And now we have the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. They're running out of adjectives now. Uh, in terms of how much more data they can get, in terms of how deep they can go, how far back they can look in time. And a lot of what Hubble has been doing is looking at galaxy clusters for this reason of looking at the distortions of galaxies in the distance. You might not be able to see them, but these little lines that exist almost everywhere are distant galaxies that have been distorted by the light's passage through these galaxy clusters. By looking at those distortions, you get a handle on dark matter. And dark matter is still one of those big anomalies in the sense that we know it's there, but we don't really understand why or what it is. And so lots of people are working on dark matter surveys, and Hubble is one that's looked at various galaxy clusters to try and get a handle on dark matter. Other, other telescopes are now picking up the challenge of continuing that job of looking at galaxy clusters to try and understand the origin of dark matter. So scientifically, it's impossible to cover everything in, in, in just a short time. But the other aspect of the legacy I wanted to say something about is just the way it's touched the public consciousness. The fact that the public have been along for the ride. The public paid for it, so they should be. But sometimes you can't imagine a scientific instrument gaining as much interest as the output of the Hubble Space Telescope. Some lovely quotes from an uh, from, uh, astronomer. The laws of physics have created these incredible structures, such as the pillars of creation, etc. Um, so visually quite stunning images, um, and the Hubble has revealed these structures. And a, a rather nice quote, through all the research, Hubble has brought the public along for the ride. It has taken the excitement that scientists feel with new discoveries and brought that excitement to non-scientists. And that is one of the most important legacies of the Hubble. Scientific legacy for sure, but getting the public on board with what the Hubble is doing and what astronomers are trying to do, what scientists are trying to do, is arguably just as important. So let's just indulge ourselves for a few minutes and look at some of the incredible images that the Hubble has produced in the last few years. This is one of my favorites, the Helix Nebula, or the Helix Nebula, visible low in the south from England, not very high in the sky, but one of the most incredible planetary nebulas. So big, it's, it's a fraction of the size of the full moon in the sky, but not particularly bright. The antenna galaxies, these are galaxies in collision. And it might sound dramatic, but basically it's thought that galaxy collisions are responsible. All of the pink is new star-forming regions, so galaxy collisions are responsible for making new stars. The familiar Crab Nebula, seen in more detail than any other telescope. A supernova remnant from back in 1054. Mystic Mountain, part of the Eta Carina Nebula. Unfortunately, in the Southern Hemisphere, not visible from the UK. But incredible structures that have been molded by the stellar winds from various embedded stars. One of my favorite galaxies, M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. Spectacular halo and that such well-defined dust ring around the, uh, the central line. A globular cluster M5, a reminder that many telescopes find it difficult to resolve stars, especially in the core of a globular cluster. And that's where the Hubble excels, because it's able to look at individual stars all the way into a core, and hence get information on hundreds of thousands of stars. One of the many spiral galaxies that have been imaged by Hubble, this one, a very pronounced bar a huge bar that's almost as long as the actual spiral arms themselves. 
The Milky Way is a barred spiral, but not quite as dramatic as that. So looking at some galaxies tells us about galactic evolution. Some galaxies are just extraordinarily beautiful, regardless of their scientific input. The familiar pillars of creation imaged very early on in Hubble's history, and then again 25 years later as an anniversary when the new camera was available. It was re-imaged. This is the newer image of the two taken with the 16 megapixel chip. We've already had a look at the ultra deep field, and again a reminder that apart from one or two stars, you're looking at all galaxies there. More than anything, that gave us a perspective on where we sit in the universe. So that was just indulgement and uh, just showing some nice pictures, basically. But what lies beyond? Where do we go beyond Hubble? Um, surely we can use adaptive optics. Can't we use lasers on the ground, uh, telescopes on the ground, shoot lasers from the telescope, produces an artificial star in the sky, and if we look at how that star is bobbling around, we've got an idea of how the Earth's atmosphere is moving. And if we're fast enough and we have enough response on our mirrors uh, and the computing systems are fast enough, can we not adapt the mirror such that we take into account the fact that the atmosphere is bubbling and moving and making this artificial star, this laser star, uh, bob around in the atmosphere. Does that negate the need for a space telescope? Well, no, because adaptive optics does work, uh, and we, uh, the intention is to use it on, uh, on large telescopes. It's being used already on some of the medium-sized telescopes, and there are plans to use it on the 30-meter and the 40-meter uh, extremely large telescopes. But the main problem is you fire a beam of light up into the sky, you can tell what the atmosphere is doing there and correct for it, but it's not the same as what the atmosphere is doing over there or over there. It's a chaotic system. So knowing what the atmosphere is doing at one point allows you to correct for the region around where you're looking. So if you want to fire a laser right next door to that interesting exoplanet, you can get a very nice sharp image of that exoplanet. But don't expect the rest of the image that you're looking at to be sharp and you're not going to send up 10,000 lasers into your field of view to try and map where the atmosphere is turbulent. So a space telescope will be sharp corner to corner, as long as you make the mirror correctly. The whole thing will be sharp corner to corner, and you can only correct part of the field of view for ground-based telescopes. For some, for some situations, that's good enough. For others, you definitely need a space telescope. Let's just remind you of what other space telescopes exist. Kepler now decommissioned, but Ke Kepler had a very specific job to do to find uh, basically Earth-like planets. It did that by using not a chip that's just a few centimeters in size, but you can see the size of the detector there getting very close to the size of a coffee table. Um, and that shows you the field of view it was looking at. Basically, it stared at a chunk of sky. Kepler was not trying to survey the sky to see what's out there. It just stared at all of the stars in that field of view between um, Vega and Cygnus. Um, it just stared at that patch of sky and looked at the intensity of all the stars and looked for dips that tell you you've got an exoplanet moving in front of those stars. And that's how it discovered the thousands of uh, planets that it discovered in its various years of life. Gaia is another sp uh, either spacecraft or space telescope, depending on which way you look at it. Gaia is an ESA mission, and its job was to measure the positions of not just a few million, but best part of a billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and measure them to phenomenal accuracy, not just a fraction of an arc second, not even milli arc seconds, but 25 micro arc second accuracy by basically measuring the positions over and over again to get phenomenal accuracy in the positions of stars as well as how those stars move. So you get the positions of stars and you can do some spectroscopy as well. You can get the positions and the movements, the proper motion of those stars as well as their spectra. You can get an idea of the dynamics of the Milky Way. You're not going to be measuring all the stars in the galaxy, but by taking a sample of a billion stars, you can get a pretty good idea of how the Milky Way is moving. And the data release from Gaia has already produced some very interesting results. For instance, Gaia has found that as well as the large and small Magellanic Cloud satellite galaxies, there's another huge galaxy, another huge uh, 
it's a little bit contradictory, a huge dwarf galaxy. So a large dwarf galaxy is sitting just the other side of the nucleus of the Milky Way. We can't see it easily because the core of the Milky Way is in the way. The large and small Magellanic clouds are down here, but there's another galaxy which is bigger than the Magellanic clouds sitting just behind the core. And we didn't know that until Gaia started to map out where all the stars in the Milky Way were. It's going to be looking at star velocities, and it's going to produce, ultimately, a 3D map of the Milky Way. And Gaia's still got quite a few years of life left in it. Um, how does it do that with such a modest size? It's not that much bigger. It, it's, uh, its mirror is, again, only meters in size, not tens of meters. And it does it in the same way that, um, that Kepler does. It does it with a very large detector and lots of repeated measurements. So again, the Gaia detector, you can see again, uh, is getting to be sort of coffee table size rather than just a few centimeters in size. If we reflect on the Hubble Space Telescope, sorry about the pun, there's an astronaut fixing the Hubble Space Telescope with the Hubble reflected in his visor. Is there a successor waiting in the wings for when the Hubble finally dies? Well, I'm sure you've heard about the James Webb Space Telescope. Launch date is, I think, still next year, as far as I know. They've, uh, they've tested a lot of things on the ground. Uh, it's going to be a huge mirror uh, with a whole load of sun shields that will protect it from the glare of the sun and the Earth. That gives you an idea of the size. There's the Hubble mirror, 2.4 meters diameter on the left. And you can see that the James Webb primary mirror is something of order 6 meters or so in diameter. Too big to fit in a rocket, so they're going to have to fold it. So it's segmented, so basically some of the segments will fold over and it will go into space and then unfold and hopefully it will unfold correctly. <clears throat> and hopefully the shields will unfold correctly and then everything will be hunky-dory. The problem will be that it won't be anywhere where you can fix it. With the Hubble Space Telescope, it was put in orbit around the Earth at a height that the, Hubble, uh, that the shuttle could reach. The shuttle was going to launch it and the shuttle was going to service it. With the James Webb Space Telescope, it's going to be parked at L2, one of the so-called Lagrange points, which are places where you can park satellites or telescopes. It's a really weird concept, but you can orbit around nothing. There's nothing at L2, but you can still orbit around it if you so wish. You can go there and effectively park. Gaia is already there. James Webb is going to go. I'm not sure it's going to nudge Gaia out of the way or whether they're going to coexist quite happily around the L2 point. And that L2, this is not to scale, L2 is about a million miles from Earth. It's way beyond the orbit of the moon. So it is not going to be accessible by any easy means. So if things go wrong, once the James Webb is operational, it's going to be well nigh impossible to fix. And I think that's one of the reasons they're trying to be very careful to make sure that they know that everything is working correctly before they actually send it up. They do not want another Hubble fiasco. That is the last thing. And so they're testing, 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 testing in the hope that everything is worked correctly when it goes up, hopefully next year. But then they've said next year for the last five years, I think. So we shall see. What is James Webb going to do differently to, uh, to the Hubble? Well, by working mainly in the infrared, the Hubble has worked mainly in the visible with a little bit of infrared. It's got infrared filters as well. And if we look at the Pillars of Creation, for instance, Hubble did take a picture of the Pillars of Creation just by nudging into the infrared. There's a visible picture on the left. You can see that visible light hardly penetrates at all these clouds here, whereas infrared light, we can effectively see through these clouds and we can see what stars are in there and to some extent we can see through them and out the other side. So not only can we see what's going on in, in um, stellar systems like this, if we have a proto-solar system, if we have a whole load of planets that are starting to form around a star, there's loads of dust there, and it's very difficult in the optical, in the visible region of the spectrum, to see what's going on. But infrared can penetrate that and can tell us what's going on in very early solar systems. Not only that, but when we look at the distant universe, remember that the universe is expanding, and so the... Uh, the Galaxies a long way from us are effectively being carried out. They're not moving through space. Space is expanding and carrying the galaxies with them. So these very distant galaxies are moving away from us at quite incredible speeds. Most galaxies 
are made of stars in which the average spectrum of a star might be somewhere around the visible part of the spectrum. Our sun is not that unusual, and a lot of galaxies have got stars like our sun. Some are hotter, some are colder, but a lot of stars will be emitting a lot of their light in the visible part of the spectrum and a bit of infrared and a bit of ultraviolet. But if they're moving away from us, this gets redshifted from the visible into the infrared. So the further objects are, the more the light will be shifted to the infrared, and hence, if we look at the infrared, we'll see... Yes? There are some galaxies. Not all of them are very distant in, in this case. Um, in this case, these might be actually quite close galaxies that are quite small. It's difficult to gauge scale by looking at this. The most distant galaxies will be the redder ones and will, generally speaking, be the smaller ones, not necessarily the bright ones. There will be a lot of small red objects here as well as some relatively close orangey ones as well as some relatively close blue ones. But the more distant, i.e. the many billions of light years away, the visible spectrum will get shifted into the infrared. So the more distant galaxies, not necessarily the ones we're looking at here, but the more distant galaxies will be expected to be brighter if we look at them in infrared than if we look at them invisible. In other words, some galaxies here are just too faint to see. But if we were to look in the infrared, we might be able to see either those galaxies more brightly, or we can see even more distant galaxies, which would be almost invisible in the visible, but would be visible in the infrared. So that's another reason for going to the infrared. Hubble has done a fantastic job over the last 30 years, and hopefully will continue to do so for another 5 or 10 years, in the visible with a little bit of infrared. But by moving the James Webb into the definite infrared range, we hope to be able to get a better handle on stellar systems, a better handle on planetary systems, and look out into the universe even deeper than the Hubble was able to do. So I've given you a, a little recap as to why we need space telescopes and why ground-based telescopes are not the be-all and end-all. They're a lot cheaper than building space telescopes, but we still need space telescopes. I gave you a little bit of background as to how they made the mirror wrong and how they fixed it. And I tried to give you just a taste of the scientific legacy as well as the public understanding legacy that Hubble has left with, or left us with. And we can see that there is a future for space telescopes. Gaia is producing wonderful work. The James Webb, I'm sure, will produce wonderful work when they fan finally get it up there. And I'm sure there will be many space telescopes to come in the latter part of this century. Thank you all very much.